We have here Professor Bo Heistad, Professor of Nuclear Physics at the Uppsala uh, University. Welcome. Thank you very much. So you participated to the test of Lugano of the new hot ICAT. Uh, the first question is that did you participate also to a previous experiment or is it your first time? No, no, this is the second one. Okay. So the first one was actually in Ferrara the year before. Okay. And okay. Uh, um, because of the results there, we decided to make a new experiment more carefully and even including the analysis of the fuel. Oh, yes, which is the very important novelty, I mean. So, um, uh, that, yes. I want to, um, to speak about the ashes, uh, but um, first I want to make you a ge more general question. Uh, most of nuclear physicists uh, are very skeptic about the so-called uh, cold fusion or LAN. Uh, they just say nuclear fusion is impossible at this temperature because of the repulsion between the nucleus. So, uh, what, what can you say? Why do you think that in some way uh, it, it is possible some nuclear reaction in the condition typical of the, of the cold fusion? That I don't know. I'm also very skeptical because as a nuclear physicist I well know that uh, the Coulomb repulsion will prevent any fusion to take place at room temperature and even at rather high temperature. So we are approaching this phenomena just experimentally because uh, we have seen in previous experiments there is an indication that excessive heat is in fact produced and we are curious to find out experimentally if that is true or not and uh, the heat uh, being so excessive so the only source of that is what we know it could be on the on the nuclear side e meaning fusion and uh, so we have uh, have uh, uh, <coughs> checked that so in our second experiment now we were very keen on examining the fuel content because if there is a fusion going on then your fuel should also change and that's why we were very eager to find that out. But again, I'm very skeptical but that this phenomenon can occur. But we have to also relate to an experimental fact. And if we can confirm that this experimental fact is really true, then we have to go on and find explanations. But so far there is no explanation for um, there are speculations. Yes. I would say. Yes. There yes. is no, no theoretical explanation, and it's a big difference between the two concepts. And if we want to speak about speculation, just to let understand to our listener, if uh, we can just guess a process that can lower these barriers. I'm not no, looking for an explanation. I know that now there's no explanation. There's no explanation. Okay. If you, if you look at two two nuclei in isolation, I mean, just two nuclei, and see how is it possible that they can fuse. Then you have to accelerate them towards each other so they can penetrate the Coulomb barrier, meaning that they have higher energy than the Coulomb barrier. And so that condition is clear when it's just two nuclei. When those two nuclei are embedded in a metal, even the electrons from the metal might interfere in such a way that the Coulomb barrier is in fact lowered, uh, lowered in the sense that the, two, that, that the two nuclei are neutral at a shorter distance than they would be in a free case. So what I'm saying is that the, the electrons in the metal might change the conditions in favor of fusions at lower temperature in a metal, but we don't know. We don't know. So the only way of finding this out is by first doing the experiment. And again, when the experiments are confirmed, then we have something to relate to. And then we can start to think theoretically. Okay, um, I, I see some uh, par um, parallel between uh, this this theme and the so-called dark energy, dark, dark matter. We saw an effect. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah, we saw an effect. Yeah, yeah. We call this effect uh, dark energy, but actually we don't know <laughs> what is. 
Exactly, exactly. Because it, but yeah, there you have a phenomenon because the galaxies rotate in a way that must be some extra gravitational force. And then you speculate, can, what can that be? And then you call it dark matter. So there you have an observation. It's very much the same. We have a clear, we have an observation. First of all, I will also say that the observation must be confirmed by more experiments. One observation, in particular, when it comes to something dramatic, is never, never enough, enough in physics. You yeah. have to confirm it. And when we are clear about the, the experimental observation, the results of it, then we can go on. Okay, another very frequent obje objection is uh, no gamma ray, no fusion. You don't have an explanation, of course, but, but uh, is this a, a killer objection? Uh, well, it's yes and no. Of course, one would think that all radio <laughs> radioactivity or nuclear reactions would be followed by, by gamma rays or whatever. That's mostly true, but it's not true in all cases. If you look at our situation, for example, where we have hydrogen and we have lithium in the fuel, and the proton can, in fact, react with the lithium, lithium-7 isotope this time, then they form beryllium-8. Beryllium-8 is very peculiar in that way. It decays immediately yeah. in the two alpha particles. Mm -hmm. No gamma, nothing, just two alpha particles. Yeah. These two particles have kinetic energy, and those are just uh, com coming to rest in the fuel, creating heat. So there you don't have any aviation yeah. in, yeah. in, 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 the, in the first step. However, I would expect that even in this case, the helium particles have such a high energy, we are talking about between 7 and 10 MeV, that they can, on a secondary turn, turn uh, collide with the nucleus and then create low energy gammas. So basically, it is very hard to find out schemes, but it's not impossible, but it's very hard to find out schemes where there shouldn't be any, any, any gammas or betas or, or, or particles in general from nuclear reactions. So that's the second mystery. Um, for the first time you had the opportunity to analyze both the fuel before the reaction and then the ashes after the reaction. What did you find and does it make sense? Uh, well, we found an, an uh, isotopic shift, and when we found that isotopic shift, then of course we were very surprised because we were very skeptical. But uh, being skeptical, you should never be skeptical to the point that you don't examine things. So yeah, we, we that did you this. even don't want to see. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and we did the analysis with respect to the the ash. That means the burned fuel uh, in, in many different ways. So we are sure that the results we get is not just one, well, one, one result, but even we get the same results with different methods. So we found an isotopic shift in the, in the fuel. And that is dramatic. That is very dramatic because you can't have isotopic shifts in, in a material unless there is a nuclear reaction going on. Well, I wouldn't say. Uh, mostly that is the case. You can also have isotope separation by, by diffusion, for example, but that you do when you, when you, uh, uh, when you want to have uh, uranium-235 out of natural uranium, for example. So there's diffusion processes. But in this little reaction tube, there is no diffusion process going on. I'm just saying this just to be 100% sure that there are different methods of the very rare and very particular to uh, create isotopic shift. But in this case, it's clear. We got a shift in lithium, and we got a shift in nickel, and that was very surprising. So that is one clue to building up more information on, on what's going on here. And uh, this shifting yeah. is a, a coherent, I mean, with the production of energy. Same that's, order, or they yeah, are completely different? Yes, that, that, that's a very good question. Because, you know, if you take the amount of fuel we have, and then you sort of see how the isotopic shift was done, and then you trace back what kind of nuclear reactions should be behind that. And just as an example, you check, is the fuel enough to create that energy? And we did that calculation in the report, and the answer is yes. You can see in the numbers there. And, uh, and yes, and, and, and so, so uh, the amount of fuel the imaginable reactions are compatible with the total energy we got from the run. There is people there who is saying that it's not so 
show that the I mean the conservation of the ashes and so on was careful because it was uh, uh, um, it was uh, Mr. Rossi uh, that was loading and unloading. I must make this question. Uh, yeah, so, okay. can you imagine any way in which uh, Rossi could manipulate? I, I think under your eyes, the fuel or the ashes. Uh, well, of course, we were very uh, we were very careful to see that nothing uh, obscure or nothing hidden had, uh, was was going on with, with ash, just just as as a, as a precaution. But uh, the answer is no. We handled ash, of course. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Rossi was was present, and he helped us in some way. But uh, you but could also uh, choose the, the sample. Yeah, yes, yes. We, we, okay, we, okay, we picked up the sample we wanted to have a look at and so on. But of course, I mean, in principle, I mean, it's, it's, it's possible to cheat.